Hello everyone and welcome to the Kalman filter tutorial. In this video tutorial I will explain you how to implement the Kalman filter equations in Python. Special emphasis will be placed on object-oriented implementation of the Kalman filter. This means that the code that you will write will be reusable and it can easily be integrated in other programs or in your other projects. Those of you who are my subscribers or who follow my channel know by now that I always create a post that nicely summarizes everything that I will explain in this video. And consequently, here is the post. This post contains the summary of the common filter, contains graphs, and contains all the codes. A link to this post is given in the description below. In addition to this video and this post, I also created a GitHub page with all the codes and the codes can be found by clicking over here. And here is the GitHub page. And here is the code. Before I start, I would like to mention the following. It took me a significant amount of time, energy and planning to create this post and this video that you are watching. Consequently, I'm kindly asking you to press the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you very much. In my previous post, which can be found here, that is, you need to click on the link given here, I explained how to derive the common filter equations by using the recursive least squares method. My suggestion is to quickly go over this tutorial in order to better understand the true nature of the Kalman filter. You also have a YouTube video that I created that explains how to derive the Kalman filter by using the recursive least squares approach. Okay, so let's go back to the Kalman filter implementation in Python. The Kalman filter consists of two steps. This is the first step. And this is the second step. In the first step, we propagate the a posteriori estimate x k minus 1 hat plus and the a posteriori covariance matrix of the estimation error denoted by p k minus 1 plus through the system dynamics to obtain the a priori state estimate and the covariance matrix of the estimation error. So, in the first step, we use these two equations. Let us briefly explain the vectors and matrices in this equation. The a posteriori state estimate is denoted by x k minus 1 hat plus. Let us explain this notation. x is our state hat denotes the estimate, k minus 1 is the discrete time instant k minus 1, and plus denotes the a posteriori estimate, that is the estimate that takes into account the current measurement. Similarly, x minus k minus 1 hat is the a priori estimate computed at the time instant k minus 1. Here the a priori symbol is minus, hat is the symbol for the estimate, and again k minus 1 is the symbol for the discrete time instant. The a posteriori covariance matrix of the estimation error is denoted by p k minus 1 plus let us explain this notation. P is the letter that denotes the covariance matrix of the estimation error, plus is the symbol for the a posteriori, and k minus 1 denotes the discrete time instant k minus 1. So what do we do over here? We take the a posteriori estimate from the previous time instant k minus 1 and we simply propagate this a posteriori estimate through the system dynamics to obtain the a priori estimate for the next time step. Similarly, we take the a posteriori covariance matrix of the estimation error 
for the time instant k minus 1 and we propagate it through the covariance equation to obtain the a priori covariance matrix of the estimation error for the next time step k. Here, A, B are the system matrices, U is the control input, Q is the covariance matrix of the process noise, or this is the covariance matrix of the disturbances affecting the system. The underlying model associated with this equation looks like this xk is equal to 8k minus 1 multiplying xk minus 1 plus bk minus 1 uk minus 1 plus wk minus 1 and here again xk is the state 8k minus 1 bk minus 1 are the system matrices xk minus 1 is the state in the previous time step and wk minus 1 is the process disturbance. Once we are done with this step, we proceed with the step number two. So in the step number two, we obtain the measurement yk. And by using this measurement, we need to update the a priori estimate and the a priori covariance matrix. And we do that by computing these three quantities. Kk is the Kalman filter gain. It's computed like this. Xk plus hat is the a posteriori state estimate at a discrete time instant k. We update it like this. Here's our measurement. And finally, this equation over here is the equation for the propagation of the covariance matrix. This equation computes the a posteriori covariance matrix of the estimation error on the basis of the a priori covariance matrix of the estimation error. These two equations are iteratively performed and we need to go over these equations iteratively and to compute them recursively or iteratively and this graph over here summarizes this computation. So, at the discrete time instant k minus 1, we have the a posteriori estimate and the a posteriori covariance matrix. Then we propagate these two quantities through our system dynamics, and this is the step number 1 that, ex that is explained over here. Then, once we do that, the measurement yk comes in. Then, by using this measurement and by using the equations given over here, we compute the a posteriori state estimate and the a posteriori covariance matrix. And this process is repeated iteratively as the discrete time instant k increases. So basically it goes like this, propagate the dynamics, measurement comes in, do the recursive least squares to compute the a posteriori estimates, then again we go to the next time step, this is yk plus 1, the measurement arrives, here we propagate the dynamics, then again, over here, we use the recursive least squares matter to compute the a posteriori estimate. And this procedure repeats itself recursively. The goal of this video is to implement this procedure in Python. However, before we do that, we need to introduce a test example. Here we present a test example that will be used to check the implementation accuracy and performance of the Kalman filter. Basically, we consider a Newtonian particle moving with a constant acceleration A. This is the equation governing the motion or the kinematics of this particle. X2 dots is equal to A. X is our position that depends on time 
and a is a constant acceleration. So you can think of a car. Here is the sketch of the car that moves along the straight line with the constant acceleration a. By integrating this equation, that is the equation number 3 twice, we obtain the position x of t. x of t is equal to x0, where x0 is an initial position, plus w0 times time, where w0 is our initial velocity, plus 1 over 2 multiplying the acceleration and multiplying time that is squared. Here we assume that the acceleration is not known, as well as the initial position, that is x0, and the initial velocity w0. We assume that only the position is measured, however the position observation are corrupted by the measurement noise. The goal is to estimate the position x, the velocity x dot, and the acceleration x2 dots from the noisy observations of the position x, and this should be done for any time instant t. We want to design an observer or a filter that will reconstruct the position, velocity, and acceleration of this particle or of the car by only measuring or by only obtaining information about the position. And here the issue is that the position measurements are quite noisy. And we will simulate this noise in Python later on. The first step that we need to perform when deriving the common filter is to derive a state space model representing the dynamics of the system. The first step is actually to introduce the state space variables. Here, the first state space variable is x1, and we say that x1 is equal to x. That is, it's equal to our position. x2 is equal to x dot, that is, it's equal to the velocity, and x3 is equal to x2 dots, that is, it's equal to the acceleration. Now, from this equation, we obtain the equation number 6. How did we obtain this equation? Well, we can simply say that x1 dot from this equation is x dot. And we can see here that x dot is actually equal to x2, so this is equal to x2, and this is our first equation given over here. Similarly, we have that x2 dot is equal to x3, and x3 dot is equal to 0. This is because the acceleration a in this equation over here is constant. So if we take the first derivative of x3, we obtain 0. The next step is to write the, these three equations in the matrix form. Here is the matrix form of the equation number 6. Here is our state vector. This is the first derivative of the state vector. And here is our matrix AC. Now, here you have to be very careful. This state space equation is given in the continuous time. However, to implement the Kalman filter, we need to discretize this equation. To discretize the continuous time system dynamics, we will use the classical zero order hold approach. And the discretize equation is given by the equation number eight. The question is, how did we obtain the equation number 8 from the equation number 7? Well, in the classical control theory, there is one very important equation. And this equation tells us that x of t is equal to e to the power 
a continuous times time multiplying the initial condition. So, the state of the system at any time step or at any time t is equal to matrix exponential of ac times t multiplying the initial condition. Now, going back to our discretization problem, we can simply select x0 to be a state at a time interval k minus 1 multiplying h and the final state to be at k times h. And over here we will have ac e to the power ac times h. The idea is the following one. If this is our time axis, we discretize this time axis and divide this time axis into intervals of the length h. Here is our time instant k minus 1, this is the time instant k, this is the time instant k plus 1, and the distance between k and k plus 1 time instants is h. And h is a very important variable when designing the common filter. The number h or its value is the discretization period or the sampling period. So that's the main idea. Again, by using the zero order hold approach, we go from the equation 7 to the equation number 8 and we finally obtain our discretized dynamics given by the equation number 9. However, we have another issue over here. The issue is that we need to compute the matrix exponential. That is, we need to find an approach or a matter to compute e to the power ac times h. To compute the matrix exponential, we can use the time series expansion. We can expand this matrix polynomial as identity matrix times, plus actually, AC times H, plus this term over here. So let us substitute the value of AC in this equation over here, and let's see what do we get. The first term over here is computed over here, and here is the result. The second term, that is the term given over here, is computed over here. And basically, this is the result. Now, what is interesting over here? You don't need to compute the term that comes over here. This term will involve the third power of AC. This term will be zero, because if you multiply this term over here, that is, if you perform this multiplication with the system dynamics, you will obtain a zero matrix. So the result will be zero. So all the higher powers over here that involved AC to the power three, AC to the power four will be identically equal to zero. And you can see that the discretization is not a complex process. It's relatively straightforward for this example over here. And our discretized system matrix A is given over here. The final form of the state space model is given by the equation number 15. Here we introduce the output equation. Since we only measure the position and the vector xk should be read as follows, position, velocity, acceleration. And since we only measure the position, our C matrix is 1, 0, 0. And over here, v, VK is our measurement noise. Here, the covariance matrix is given by the equation number 17. Since the measurement noise is a scalar, the covariance matrix will be a scalar and it will be equal to sigma squared.
where sigma square is the variance and sigma is the standard deviation of the measurement noise. Now, notice over here that we don't have the processed noise. Consequently, our Q matrix will be equal to zero. In the sequel, we explain how to implement the Kalman filter equations in Python. Here is my Python code. As you can see over here, I'm using the spider environment. I really like the spider environment since it reminds me of MATLAB. I can simply select a piece of code, do the right click, and evaluate that piece of code. So it's very simple to debug and it's very easy to write a code in this software. Our first goal is to write a class that will implement the Kalman filter. And here is my class. Its name is Kalman filter. Here is the function that initializes the important vectors and matrices. So the question is, what do we need to initialize? Well, we need to specify the initial guess of our estimate, and that's x0. Then we need to specify an initial guess of the covariance matrix, that's p0. Then we need to initialize the system matrices a, b, c, and q, as well as the matrix r. Here, a, b, and c are state space matrices. q is the covariance matrix of the process noise, and R is the covariance matrix of the measurement noise. Notice here that for simplicity, I assume that all the matrices are constant. This is because in my example that's given over here, the matrices A, C, as well as the other matrices that are equal to zero are actually constant. That is, they don't change with time. Okay, the next step is to define and to initialize the discrete time instant k. I call the discrete time instant k as current time step and I set it to zero. Then I need to store several vectors and several matrices. So obviously by looking at the dynamics of my Kalman filter, that is by looking at these equations, I need to compute and to store this variable here and this variable over here. This is the a posteriori state estimate and this is the a priori state estimate. You don't need to store these variables for every discrete time step k going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You only need to store these variables in the previous time step and then you can update them dynamically. However, since I want to extract the trajectory of my state estimates, in this common filter implementation, I will store all the variables because I want to be able at the end, when I write my code, to diagnose my code and to troubleshoot, to investigate convergence, etc. However, if you want to implement this code in your embedded system, and once you're really sure that your code is working properly, you can only save previous values. So this list over here estimates a posteriori is used to store the a posteriori state estimates. That is, it's used to store this variable over here. On the other hand, we store the a priori state estimates in this list. Estimates a priori. And the variable is given over here. So this is the a priori variable. Next, we need to store the a posteriori and a priori covariance matrices. And these matrices are stored in these lists. So this is the list for storing the estimation error covariance matrices a posteriori and this list is used to store estimation error covariance matrices a priori. Then we need to store the gain matrices, that is the Kalman filter gain matrices that are dynamically 
computed, and these matrices are defined over here for k going to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And we need to store this part over here, and this part over here is called the prediction error. And we create a list that stores this variable, and the list is given over here. Next, we need to write a method or the function that belongs to this class that will implement the first step. Here's the first step. And the function is given over here. This function simply takes the input value, and in our case, the input value is equal to zero since we don't have inputs, and it simply computes the a priori estimates on the basis of the a posteriori estimates, that is, it simply computes the state estimate vector and the covariance matrix. After we perform these computations, we basically need to append the corresponding lists and we need to increment the current time step for one. This function will be called from another code, from our driver code, and when we basically start with filtering, we first call this function. The second function that we need to call is basically the function that implements the second step, and the second step is given over here. When the estimate, or better to say, when the measurement yk arrives, we need to go through this equation, through this equation, and through this equation to compute their corresponding quantities. And these computations are performed over here. This is the function that computes the second step. It receives yk. Then it computes the Kalman filter gain, it computes the prediction error, and it updates the a posteriori estimate. Then it computes the a posteriori covariance matrix, and finally this function, as you might expect, updates the corresponding lists. It updates the list storing the gain matrices, it updates the list storing the errors, it updates the list storing the a posteriori estimate, and it updates the list storing the matrices representing the covariance matrices of our problem. Okay, now that we know how to write a class that implements the Kalman filter, let us see how to use this class in practice. And here is my driver code for using the class I just wrote. The first step is to import the libraries. I import the NumPy library, I import the plotting tools, and from this file, kalmanfilter.py, I import kalmanfilter. Next, I define my discretization step, and I define the initial values for the simulation. I define the initial position, I define the initial velocity, and finally, I define the acceleration. Going back to my model, I define this equation over here. Here is my initial state, here is my initial position, and here is my acceleration. And over here, in my Python code, I simply specify these variables. Then I need to specify the measurement noise standard deviation. I select the measurement noise with the standard deviation 1, and next I define the number of discretization steps. I select or I choose 100 discretization steps. Next, I define my discretized dynamics. This is my Newtonian system. This is my A matrix. That is the discretized A matrix. You have to be very careful. So this is our A matrix. Then, 
here's my C matrix. And going back to my Python code, here's my C matrix. B matrix is zero matrix because I don't have an input, an external input. This is my measurement noise covariance matrix. And this is basically my process noise covariance matrix. It's equal to zero since I assume that I don't have a process noise. Next, I make a guess of the initial state. Over here, I select all the initial guesses to be zero, zero, zero. So I assume the initial velocity is zero, in actually initial position is zero, initial velocity is zero, and initial acceleration is zero. Then I select my covariance matrix, that is, I select the initial covariance matrix, it's simply equal to an identity matrix. Next, I define my time vector for performing the discretization and simulation. I start from zero, I end that and that number of time steps minus one times h, and I have number of time steps particles in between. Next, I define vectors used to store this simulated position. I define a vector position, and I define the vector velocity. That will store my position and my velocity. And over here, I simulate the system, that is, I simply discretize this equation, that is, I evaluate x for 0, k is equal 1, k is equal 2, k is equal to 3, where the distance between k and k plus 1 is h. And this is happening over here. Over here, once I simulate our output, that is, our position, I add the measurement noise, and this vector over here position noisy is used as yk in our common filter. So this is our yk. So let us execute and let us plot and let us compare the ideal position with the noise perturbed position. So I will select this piece of code and I'll press F9. And on this graph over here, I can basically see my ideal position and I can see my observed position. The observed position is obviously very noisy. And this observed position, will... next on the code line 73, that is over here, I create and I initialize my Kalman filter. I initialize my Kalman fil filter with x0, that is, an initial guess of the state estimate, P0, an initial guess of the covariance matrix, A, B, and C, the system matrices, and the covariance matrices, Q and R. Then, over here, I specify that my input is equal to zero. Then, in this loop, the loop starting from the code line 76 and ending at the code line 78, I simply iterate my Kalman filter equations. So what do I do? I start from J0, then I call the function propagate dynamics, I specify the input value and the input value is zero since I don't have input. This function will compute the a priori state estimate and the a priori covariance matrix for the next step. And this is graphically shown over here. So here I propagate dynamics, k minus 1 is equal to 0 here, and I simply propagate dynamics, and this is step 1. Then I need to call the step 2, that is, I need to call the function that implements the step 2. And I call the function compute a posteriori estimate, and I specify my noisy measurement. So this function will basically take these a priori variables, take the measurement, and compute the a posteriori estimate and the a posteriori covariance matrix. That is, this step will compute the equation number two. 
and I iterate. I go j is equal to 1, then I say j is equal to 2, j is equal to 3, etc. And in the end, you will obtain a state vector at every time instant k. k is equal to 0, k is equal to 1, etc. until the length of this time vector. Next, we run the Kalman filter. We can obtain the results by executing the code line 80. That is, we can access the list called estimates a posteriori. And this list contains time series of the state space variables that we estimated. It's kind of difficult to analyze this time series since it's very long and it contains many variables. So a better approach for visualizing the results is to plot the estimates and to plot the true values of the state space variables. To visualize the results, we create three lists, estimate one, estimate two, and estimate three, and these lists store the estimated values, that is, the estimates of the position in the list estimate 1, estimate of the velocity in the list estimate 2, and the estimate of the acceleration in the list called estimate 3. We fill in these lists, and then we create three vectors storing the true values of the position, velocity, and acceleration. And finally, we plot the results. This graph over here shows the results. The red lines in these graphs correspond to the true values of position, true value of velocity, and the true value of the acceleration. The blue lines in these graphs correspond to the estimate. Here is the estimate of the position, here is the estimate of the velocity, and here is the estimate of the acceleration. Over here, that is at this point over here, at this point over here, and at this point over here, we can see the initial values of acceleration, initial value of velocity, and the initial value of position. Let us analyze this graph over here. Here is our initial guess of the acceleration, and the Kalman filter performs estimation. We see that the estimates diverge from the true values. However, after some time, they start to return and they converge to the true value of the acceleration. The acceleration over here is constant. Consequently, that's why you see a straight constant line for the true acceleration. However, velocity is not constant. Since the acceleration is constant, velocity is a linear function and the true value is a straight line. And we start from zero initial guess, and we can see that we have a better convergence for velocity. So our estimates also converge to the true value of velocity. And finally, let us analyze the position results. We assume that the initial position is zero. However, the true position was close to 10. However, our filter is able to relatively quickly converge to the true value of position. Okay, that would be all for today. I hope that you liked this video. If you like the videos I create, please subscribe and support my channel. Thank you very much and have a nice day.